Keep the Aspidistra Flying by George Orwell. Every line of serious work that I have written since 1936 has been written directly or indirectly against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism. George Orwell. Although Orwell is best known for his anti-communist works, such as 1984 or Animal Farm, it is important to remember that Orwell was a democratic socialist. Orwell, throughout his life, struggled with the question of socialism and what it means to be a socialist. Keep the Espidistra Flying, published in 1936, continues this struggle. Orwell was born in 1903 in Modahari, Bengal. In 1917, he was given a scholarship to Eton College, which he attended until 1921. Orwell was a poor boy in a setting where poverty was despised, and this helped to make him a youthful radical. He served in Burma with the Indian Imperial Police from 1922 to 1927 and he came to detest his role as an agent of imperialism. He ended up identifying with the Burmese more than with his fellow British officers, and in 1927 he retired and decided to live among the least privileged members of society. These experiences provided much of the material for his early works, including Keep the Espidistra Flying. In 1936, Orwell was sent by the Socialist Left Book Club to study the living conditions of the unemployed in England. Orwell angered his sponsors by writing The Road to Wigan Pier, in which he criticized Orthodox Socialism. Orwell went to Spain during the Spanish Civil War and joined the militia unit of the Mar Marxist Workers' Party. Orwell was seriously injured in the war. He was also involved in the fighting between the communists and the anti-communists, sorry, between the communists and the anarchists in Barcelona. The communist secret police sought out Orwell and he fled from Spain. One question that Orwell faces is, how does a socialist function in a capitalist society? This is taken in the person of Gordon Comstock in the novel Keep the Espidistra Flying. Gordon is not a socialist. However, Orwell uses Gordon to convey the message to socialists. Gordon is a man who is disgusted by the capitalism he sees around him. As a student, Gordon writes an underground newspaper in which he adv advocates global socialism, although he will later in his life reject socialism and the dismemberment of the British Empire. However, once Gordon graduates from school and enters the workforce, the question of how he reacts to capitalism must become clearer. Gordon worked in an advertising company where his literary talents were discovered and he was put in a very profitable position with a very optimistic future. However, Gordon could not escape the feeling that he had sold his soul to the money god. To the consternation of all his relatives, Gordon left the company. Gordon at first had an overly romanticized view of poverty. Coming from a dreary middle-class family, Gordon thinks poverty is where one feels one is alive, the excitement of living out on the streets. Gordon finds out otherwise, that poverty is having to sneak away from the landlady and always having a hungry feeling in one's stomach. Gordon ends up taking a job in a secondhand bookshop where he can barely make ends meet and where there is no chance of advancement. Orwell presents some interesting paradoxes in Keep the Espidistra Flying. Through Gordon's eyes, we are allowed to see the despicable character of capital capitalism. However, Gordon's attempt to rebel against capitalism only brings misery to himself 
and to his girlfriend, Rosemary. If Orwell approves neither of capitalism nor of Gordon's rebellion against it, then what is Orwell trying to say in this book? Critics have differed in their interpretation. Some argue that Orwell agreed with Gordon's moral conviction, but the purpose of the book was to show how deeply our society revolves around money, and it, it is impossible not to be obsessed with money in our society. In this light, the book becomes almost more a critique of society than of Gordon. Gordon had noble ambitions, but he was defeated by an evil society. While there is some appeal to this point of view, I think it ignores the fact that much of Gordon's misery is self-inflicted. Another variation on this is that it is foolish for Gordon to even try to rebel against capitalism in the first place, and his whole quest to escape the money god is foolish. Let us assume for a moment that this is indeed what Orwell is trying to show. If this is the case, I believe Orwell has made a poor argument. Orwell could have designed a book about a man who recognized how hollow the value of wealth and possessions are, and tried to give everything to give away everything he had and live in poverty. This man would then come to take pride in his po poverty. He would shun the traditions of the middle class. This is not, however, the situation that Orwell sets up. The character of Gordon is obsessed with the social value of money throughout the whole book. In fact, Gordon does not even want other people to know he is living in poverty. He is forever concerned about whom he borrows money from and how people treat him because of his poverty. If, in fact, the argument of Orwell's book is that one cannot escape the money god in a capitalistic society, then this would fit in with that argument. In trying to escape from money, Gordon ends up becoming obsessed with it. I would argue, however, that many individuals have successfully escaped the quest for accumulating wealth and are able to simply not care about money. There is much in the character of Gordon Comstock that is autobiographical to Orwell. Like Orwell, Gordon is a writer. Like Gordon, Orwell worked in a bookstore in London and hated it. Orwell himself knows what it is like to be poor. In his travels in Paris, described in his book, Down and Out in Paris and London, Orwell had to make ends meet on one shilling a day. Now this is five times less than his character of Gordon. Orwell actually describes many of the same feelings Gordon has. In the book, Down and Out in Paris and London, Orwell describes how women are repulsed by him because he has no money. Orwell also, also describes what a good feeling it can be to slide all the way into the very bottom of poverty because there is a relief that accompanies the realize, realization that one has hit rock bottom and one is still surviving. Gordon also expresses a number of the same view. Uh, views that Orwell expresses in Down and Out in Paris and London. To Orwell, Gordon is not simply an abstract character he uses. Gordon is very much a reflection of Orwell. I believe that Keep the Espidistra Flying is a difficult book to interpret because Orwell himself is ambivalent. He understands the problem all too well, but he is unsure of the solution. Orwell seeks to show, through the character of Gordon, his own experience in revolting against capitalism. Of course, Gordon is not the only character Orwell sets up. Orwell, Orwell realizes there is more than one way of rebelling, uh, rebelling against capitalism, and so he shows Philip Ravelston as an alternative rebel. 
Orwell sets up Ravelston as a foil for Gordon. Although both men are anti-capitalists, they take different approaches. Gordon lives in self-imposed poverty and is miserable because of it. Revelston is a rich man, living in luxury, yet is a socialist. Revelston's optimism is a contrast to Gordon's pessimism. However, the reader gets a sense that Revelston does not know what he is talking about. Orwell uses Ravelston to critique the Cadillac Communist. At the beginning of chapter 5, Orwell describes Ravelston. Ravelston lives in Regent Park, which to him was practically the same thing as living in the slums. It was part of a lifelong attempt to escape from his own class and become, as it were, an honorary member of the proletariat. Like all such attempts, it was foredoomed to failure. Or Orwell also states that Ravelston had the habit of dressing unconventionally. He made a point of going everywhere, even to fashionable house and expensive restaurants, in these clothes just to show his contempt for the upper class con conventions. He did not fully realize that it is only the upper classes who can do these things. Orwell goes on to say about Ravelston, in every moment of his life, he was apologizing tacitly for the large, largeness of his income. You could make him as uncomfortable by reminding him that he was rich as you could make Gordon by reminding him that he was poor. In these quotes, Orwell is able to describe Ravelston as somebody whose entire life is a contradiction. His attempts to make himself a socialist only make his wealth more glaring. In chapter 5, Gordon and Ravelston go to a pub and have some drinks and talk. Orwell attempts to show the folly of both Ravelston's approach to capitalism and Gordon's approach. Gordon's approach, which is the subject of the book, is shown to be self-destructive as it makes Gordon miserable and separates him from the ones he loves. Revelston's approach is not shown in this way. He is always depicted as happy. His approach as a young rich man playing socialist is shown as harmless. However, Revelston's approach is hypocritical, where at least Gordon faces the reality of his decision to make war on money. During the course of the conversation, Ravelston mentions several times that Gordon should read Marx, while Gordon indicates his distaste for socialism. Orwell presents somewhat of an irony here, in that the rich man is defending Marx against a poor man. However, Orwell is also trying to make a point. Ravelston is incapable of understanding what he is talking about, because he has never known what it is like to be poor. It is Orwell's critique of the intellectual rather than the experimental socialist. At one point, Gordon is talking about how miserable life in London is and how it is all a result of poverty. Revelston responds with, of course, after all, it's only a reflection of what Marx said. Every ideolo ideology is a reflection of economic circumstances. Gordon then answers, Ah, but you only understand it out of Marx. You don't know what it means to have to crawl along on two quid a week. In the same chapter that Orwell contrasts Ravelston with Gordon, he also contrasts Ravelston with Hermione, sorry, with Hermione Slater. Hermione is Ravelston's lover, and he adores her. On one hand, the same Ravelston who looks hypocritical with contrasted, when contrasted with Gordon looks much better when contrasted with Hermione. Just as the reader is beginning to get disgusted with Ravelston, 
Orwell shows how so many rich people, like Hermione, do not even try to care about the poor people at all. Don't talk to me about the lower classes, Hermione says to Ravelston. I hate them. They smell. At the same time, however, Orwell also raises the question of why Ravelston is so in love with Hermione if he takes his beliefs seriously. Ravelston adores her, and yet it does not seem to bother him that Hermione laughs at all his principles. Why do you have to live in such a dreadful way, pretending you're poor when you're not, Hermione says to him, and living in that pokey flat with no servants, and going about with all these beastly people? In this way, Orwell uses Hermione both to make Ravelston look more favorable and to further point out his hypocrisy. Hermione, in one of her speeches, shows she does not understand what a socialist really is. Of course you're a socialist, she says. So am I. I mean, we're all socialists nowadays. But I don't see why you have to give all your money away and make friends with the lower classes. You can be a socialist and have a good time. That's what I say. Orwell obviously intends to satirize this belief because, of course, giving your money away and making friends with the lower classes is what socialism is all about. However, Orwell is making another point, too. If Ravelston can call himself a socialist and still live in such luxury compared to Gordon, then what is to stop Hermione from calling herself a socialist? Orwell shows how Ravelston, for all his good intentions, does not really sympathize with the poor. Uh, quoting from the book, In the taxi she lay against him, still half asleep, her head pillowed on his breast. He thought of the unemployed in Middlesbrough, seven in a room on 25 bob a week. But the girl's body was heavy against him, and Middlesbrough was so far away. End quote. Ravelston is able to think of the poor only in the abstract sense, and so they do not seem real to him. He is able to dismiss, dismiss them so easily in favor of his life of luxury, which is very real to him. Orwell uses chapter 5 to set up Ravelston as an alternative way to make war on money, rather than the self-destructive way Gordon has chosen. However, Orwell also shows the meaninglessness in Ravelston's war. For all the misery Gordon's own war brings him, at least it is honest. The book ends with Gordon getting his girlfriend Rosemary pregnant. Gordon gives up his war on money and becomes, in the words of one critic, a disastrously defeated rebel. Many critics have criticized the ending. Again, it brings up questions about what Orwell was trying to say. Does the failure of Gordon's war mean Orwell views a war against capitalism to be fatal? To be fatal? One must either delude oneself, as Ravelston does, or end in defeat as Gordon. Again, I believe the ending is supposed to be ambivalent. Orwell himself is still struggling with these questions. So rather than give the audience an answer, he just throws out the topic for them to think about. Yeah, I wrote that back in 1999 when I was, what, 21 at the time, I think. Um, now that I'm a little bit older and I have a little bit more life experience under me, I think maybe Orwell is more right when I gave him credit for it here. You know, I said, I believe it's impossible to kind of not care about money and still be happy. I think that was the naive view of someone who was still a student. I think at a certain point, kind of life catches up to you and you've got to care about money. Um, especially once you start a family. Also, um, I think 
I didn't quite realize at the time what Orwell, the truth of what Orwell is kind of really saying in this book is that, you know, you can say, I don't care about money and kind of give up your successful job, but then there is a social cost for that. Uh, you know, people treat you differently if you're poor than if you're rich. Uh, and to the extent that humans kind of seek validation from other people, uh, I think that social cost for kind of deliberately living in poverty can be very real, which is not to say that there's nothing noble about it, but I think, yeah, that picture he paints of kind of Gordon Comstock kind of miserable life in poverty. Uh, Comstock thinks, Gordon thinks it's gonna be this romantic life of being poor and kind of having, you know, authentic experiences and kind of real blood running through his veins once he gets rid of capitalism. And instead it's just boring and miserable and hungry and drudgery. And I, yeah, I think there's kind of more truth to that than I gave to credit at the time. Uh, I'm probably due to reread this book one of these days. Something I didn't mention in this review, but which I picked up in the years since, I think on Wikipedia or something, is Orwell himself viewed this book as a bit of a failure. In fact, if memory serves, sorry, I should have looked this up on Wikipedia to refresh my memory before I turned on the camera, but I think this is true. He actually didn't want this book published. Uh, it ended up being kind of published after his death. I think maybe he changed his mind against, came around then or something, I don't know. I, sorry, I should, have, I should have looked this up before I turned on the camera. Anyways, you can go to Wikipedia yourself and kind of look this up. He kind of viewed this book as one of his failures, but I quite like it. I, th I think there's a lot of truth in this book. I think this, uh, I think it's a good thing it ended up getting published. Okay, anyways, I'll sign off here.